All right, everybody. Thanks so much for your patience and getting this one out to you. I had some slides put together that I was going to present out. Thought I could do it live on Facebook because I've streamed from Zoom to Facebook before, uh, but looks like with some te technical difficulties there, a new landscape, a new back end on the Facebook side. I've had a lot of updates recently. I need to go in and learn that and adjust some settings so I can do that better for one. Uh, for two, it took me a little bit longer to get that slide put together. And now I'm I'm doing this via Zoom and recording it here. And I'm going to up, upload it. Obviously, when you're seeing this, it's uploaded into the group. So thanks for your patience on that front. Uh, the lighting in here, I had to set it up this way because this fan over here, this light, it's terrible lighting from behind like that. And this is the only space that I have here in uh, in my room to be able to do this video for you guys when my desk is set up in here. So it just looks weird. So ignore the, the lack of lighting in the background. Got some other stuff going on here on that front to, to help out, but it's mostly gonna be a, a slideshow side of things and walking through some of that. So you'll be seeing most of that. So let's just jump right into it. So, how baseball players can overcome burnout and reignite their passion for the game. I mean, this is something that is a subject not a lot of people really talk about. One of the biggest reasons I would say is, is kind of a guy mentality, a man's world kind of thing, right? You know, men aren't supposed to share their emotions. There's no crying in baseball, rub some dirt on it kind of thing when there's definitely a value in that kind of mentality, but at the same time, kids just keep showing up and showing up and doing what they're told and they're just getting burnt out. They're playing too much ball. They're a lot of the stuff that we're going to dive into. Right. And it's negatively impacting baseball. And I want to do something that can try to help players get back to that. And I, I think it starts with you, the parents, you, the coaches, and, and helping these players realize because we are the influences in their lives. So the landscape has changed over the last 10 to 15 years. I'm not that old, okay? I'm only 31 years old. Uh, in, a, in a few more months, believe it or not, I'm going to be 32. It's crazy. And when I was playing, so much of what is happening in baseball today wasn't really going on. I mean, a lot of the stuff we're going to dive into, it just wasn't happening at that same pace, at that same rate. And players are better than they ever were today. I mean, you look at any sport and every major league level sport, basketball, football. I mean, guys are bigger, they're faster, they're stronger, they're smarter, they're better than the classes before them. And that's just changing the way guys are playing. It changes the way that guys have to develop and prepare themselves. And it's changing the pressure that is put on players today. And so many kids are just giving it up way too early. I, I know so many baseball players I thought had a lot of potential that had a little bit of drive and motivation, but because they weren't seeing success early on or they were successful for a little while then, and then they stopped seeing success because they – jump to a new level of competition, a new age, whatever it was, you know, their bodies grew and they weren't quite the same or the other kids got bigger and they didn't. I mean, so many different things happen that cause guys to get burnt out and not have the same passion that they once had for the game. And they could have been really great ball players. Now, this isn't a conversation we're having that's leading towards every player is going to be a major league talent, is going to be a division one talent. There are hundreds of thousands of baseball players in the world. We all know the stats, right? We all know the numbers, how it goes down, right? It goes from however many high school players are, let's say there's like 500,000 across the country, uh, then maybe only 60%, uh, 60%, way less than 60%, 60,000, because I looked this up, there's 1,700 colleges that have baseball programs and a roster on Division One can have a 30 or 35 players, I believe, on that roster. And that's pretty much most programs is going to have that. So, I mean, you're really looking at about 60,000 guys. So you go from 
500,000, maybe there's more than that, right? There could be 600, 700,000. I mean, some of these stats I were looking up were a few years old and it's really hard to track that because so many guys coming in, starting out, they come out for tryouts and maybe they're tracking those numbers. So we're just guessing here, right? We're trying to get a ballpark number, pun intended. And less than 10%, really probably 5% of baseball players go from high school to college. And it's even way less, we know it's way less than that. They go from college to the pros, even from minor leagues, from single to double, every level you go up, there's less and there's less players. Now, obviously the higher up we get, you know, from college and beyond, a lot of that's gonna have to do with skill, talent and abilities, right? But the vast majority of players that we're talking about here, the bulk of these half a million guys still have, a lot of potential to make that cut. And I played NAIA and D3 ball. There were some pretty shitty baseball players on my team that had no right playing college baseball. And I also played with several guys who ended up getting drafted. And I played on uh, some ranked teams that were cut out for the World Series at our level. So there is a lot of talent across the board but there are also guys who don't deserve to be there and there's a lot of opportunities for guys who give up way too early and that's one of the big things I want to be able to do here is help baseball players if they truly want to get to that next level help them get there all right so I'm going to be adjusting this in and out because I think this is going to record over that um, never mind those numbers. I, I was rushing to get this out there on the bottom there, and, and I wanted to get it out. So there may be some little things I miss that happens. But problems players are facing today, I mean, one of the biggest ones is social media. You know, I'm not going to sit here and try to act like this old head because a lot of the people that are watching this video, you know, parents and coaches, y'all are probably older than me. But my dad was very strict growing up, Okay. Phones, smartphones weren't a thing when I was in middle school and high school. I mean, the smartest phone out there was the BlackBerry Curve, and only the rich kids got that phone, right? And I didn't get my first phone until I was 16, okay? And the capabilities I had on that phone, I had 200 minutes and zero texts. I mean, I would get my ass chewed if I got sent out texts. And the funniest part Dad, if you're watching this video, it would crack me up that he would do this. And I would get so mad. My dad would text me questions like, when are you going to come home? Or how long are you going to be? Or like random little stuff like that. I'm like, I can't reply to you because I don't have any texts. And then you're going to have to pay for these texts. It's like, And then, okay, I finally got 100 texts or 200 texts. I mean, nowadays, like kids instantly have complete access to everything on the internet. I mean, the hack back in the day was I had to get the iPod Touch that was like a mini iPhone and be able to connect to Wi-Fi so I could download an, a texting app that was free so I could text other people from a fake number so I could act, feel like I had a phone and be able to connect to kids in high school, right? Like I was definitely pushing for it when I was, you know, a freshman or sophomore in, in high school, right? I definitely wanted to get a phone. Everybody else was having one. I just felt like I was missing out. Uh, but the capabilities of the phones back then and the advancement of social media in particular was nowhere near what it is. I mean, back then Facebook was just getting started when I was in high school and it was really started out created for high school or for college kids to connect with the people on their campus. And you had to like have an actual college email address to sign up for Facebook at the time. I remember that kind of being a big thing. And then Instagram slowly came along and these other things, right? And one of the mentors that I followed uh, in, in the fitness business world told me this crazy stat back in, in like 2016, but there is more information and content being created every hour. And at this point, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if it was like every minute or every five minutes than was ever created in human history up to that point. I mean, there's so many content creators, people with YouTube channels, blogs, new websites, all this stuff. I mean, we are rapidly putting out information and consuming information. The scroll, the infinite scroll on social media, I was not getting that when I was a kid. 
the guys who were playing before me, the the Barry Bonds days, the Mark McGuire's days, the old heads in baseball now, those guys didn't have that kind of information and access to things that, that kids do now. And it's very addicting. And, you know, think back to like when TVs first came out and there was somebody on the TV, they were considered to be important. They were an expert. They were famous whatever it was, like we were glued to the TV and we still are in a lot of ways, but the TV is our screen. And any person who is on social media these days and they're seeing others out there, they're viewing them as somebody important. There's this dopamine rush that's happening and there is just way too much when it comes to the social media side of things. And we'll talk about, you know, like the pros and cons here. Um, obviously, you know, you can really shorten the learning curve with social media, especially things like YouTube. TikTok has grown huge. I mean, I, I, I have a lot of videos on my phone saved of TikToks of things that I've learned from other people, right? And there's a lot of really smart people in this world that now have a great platform to share their message for free that normally you would have to go and travel across the country, across the world or the globe to go and learn and be able to get access to these people and pay thousands, tens of thousands, maybe millions of dollars to learn what they knew. And before it was CD courses, it was videos, uh, VHS tapes that you would have to go and buy to, to learn from them. And now it's all available at the palm of their hand. So, I mean, that learning curve, being able to learn from true experts out there is huge. They want to connect with family, friends, right? You guys can read this stuff off. I don't need to read everything off to you, but a couple of big ones are definitely the exposure to college coaches, the access that players have to coaches. I mean, it's a quick DM. Coaches, I know division one coaches who are on social media and I've DM them to ask them to be on shows that I've hosted, podcasts that I've hosted, and they have replied and they have come on. I can get their email. There's a website. I went and bought um, the email of every single college coach out there that was on this database. And it was accurate. And you can, it was like 25, 30 bucks. I'd have to go back and look if you, you know, comment down below, if that's kind of something you would want access to, I'll go back and try to remember um, what the website is. I don't remember offhand, but you, you could, for less than 30 bucks, you could buy every college baseball coach's email and have that access. So you could email blast out to every coach that you wanted to contact, right. And get your, uh, get your scouting videos out there, get your recruiting videos out there, all this stuff. Now information overload paralysis by analysis is huge. So many kids are just getting overwhelmed with the amount of information, with the amount of things that they're seeing. And they're learning a lot of the wrong things from the wrong people. And they haven't had the time, the experience to really see what it is that life is about. I mean, you're being sold things that you don't have perspective otherwise to be able to tell truth or fact or fiction from. You know what I mean? So it's, it's hard for the younger kids to be able to discern what is quality information, what is truthful, and what is it that somebody has 100,000 followers, their video went viral, or there's some kind of hook or hype that the person is talking about that makes sense logically, makes sense in the moment, catches your attention, but is it really what is going to solve the need? Is it really going to be very helpful or is just flat out misinformation to try to sell something? You know, I, as I was typing this out uh, downstairs, I heard the roommate was listening to, you know, had a TV on a commercial came on and it was talking about how to use this tool to instantly get rid of sciatica. And I'm like, Oh my God, my health and fitness background, you know, just came out and I'm like, we're not going to go there. This magic pill bullshit. It's not real. Right. But I think two of the big other ones, as you can read, comparing themselves to what others have or who they are, the other big thing, they are seeing all of these videos of these highlight reels of showcases of guys who are throwing 95 on the mound in high school, who are hitting 450 foot homers at 13, 14 years old in these home run derbies. They're seeing all these things and they think that's what success looks like. They think that is what I have to do if I want to get seen by college coaches, if I want to play 
at, at division one baseball, there's definitely that D one or bust mentality when it comes to college ball. And that's an, uh, and that's another story for another day, but they're just not being sold the right information is really what it comes down to. They're developing a false belief of what success really looks like. And we're going to dive into how you can, you know, redefine success here in a little bit, uh, but just not having the right context of things. That's a huge one. You know, a lot of times on social media, things get taken out of context. Somebody says one little quote. I mean, you know, I'm not going to get political here at all, but this is a great example. Donald Trump, you know, somebody takes CNN or MSNBC or one of these news channels takes a quote that he said out of a, out of a 20 minute uh, segment. And now all of a sudden he looks like a terrible person. When, if you go and watch the whole video and what it is that he's actually talking about, it makes sense. He's not being a bad person, et cetera. Right. It's not just Trump. There's a lot of other examples of that, but that's really, I mean, the out of context side of things that's happening with social media that too many people, it's just a highlight reel. Social media for so many people is all about putting out their best selves, their highlight reels, all the successes that they're having, all of the wins, all of the great home runs that they're hitting, but they don't show all of the failures, all of the things that, you know, the grind, the things that actually had to happen to get them there, you know, and it's just, it's shooting kids down and they're losing confidence when they see this because they're judging where they're at right now to that level thinking that they have to be there when they're viewing themselves against guys who are five, 10 years older than them, who don't even have the same physiques as they do. It's just, it's things that should not be compared. It's apples and oranges. All right. The second big thing is the surge of travel baseball. When I was growing up, I played little league ball. I mean, there was rec baseball, right? We played T-ball. There was coach pitch, machine pitch, you know, even American Legion, Babe Ruth, and Cal Ripken baseball leagues were such a thing. And now in Texas, I look, Texas has less American Legion baseball teams than Connecticut. Connecticut is tiny. Texas is probably one of, if not the biggest baseball state compared to Florida and California, uh, maybe like Georgia or Nevada. Um, wait, not Nevada, uh, Arizona, excuse me. I'm, I'm thinking of like Phoenix area. So these kids are just at an early age from si the six U baseball tournaments, eight U, 10 U baseball tournaments, They're just travel baseball all the time. And especially when you're in the bigger hubs, it's so much easier. I mean, it's just, it used to be the guys who were playing on travel baseball teams were the cream of the crop. They were the guys who were probably going to play D1. They're probably going to get drafted. And they were actually traveling across the country playing on these showcase type teams. I mean, it's not like this is a new concept, right? But the very first travel ball team that I played on, I was 14. I was an eighth grader. And that was the very first time that I played. That I was playing Little League Baseball. I played Babe Ruth. I played American Legion. And I played with guys who got drafted who were playing American Legion Baseball with me. Right. A guy by the name of Colt Lears is one of the best baseball players I had seen growing up that I was getting to play with was a three sport athlete. He was all American at football. He was, uh, you know, all all league in, in basketball and was a stud at third base and had a cannon for an arm and hit bombs. Right. The dude was an absolute freak of an athlete and he played all these sports. He was playing them. You baseball, basketball, football, there's no break between them. You went from one to the other. And then there's summer baseball. And that's when, you know, it was all like, <laughs> you, you don't have to play year round travel baseball like everybody is doing today. And sure, there is, well, let me move this over here. Like the Little League World Series is going on right now, right? Today is, is Wednesday, August 24th. You know, we're, we're getting closer to the end of the Little League World Series. That's always been a big thing. But these Little league baseball doesn't really exist. These kids are playing on travel baseball teams. These kids are obviously better than, than most kids, right? That's why they're able to be in this, but it's so much pressure because, I mean, let's get into it here. You know, there's pros and cons, obviously, right? 
you're getting to play against better competition. Typically, there's higher quality coaches. Now, I know a lot of travel ball teams that really don't have good coaches. They still got dad ball coaches. But typically, when you're paying for coaches, you're going to get a little bit better coaches than you would at the rec level. Uh, usually, there's a lot of clubs that have uh, their own facilities. They're going to have better equipment, and you can train more often, go to the facility, things like that. And if you're in the right organization, yeah, there's – going to be connections through these coaches they're going to know college guys they're going to know scouts they're going to be able to help guide you to get to that next level but a lot of i mean a lot of the pro there's a lot of cons there's a lot of cons to this and one of the biggest ones that i really wish people would take a look at not only obviously the year-round baseball but it's not a natural schedule travel baseball is 100 percent tournament baseball that's all it is there is no league play anymore but at the high school level, the college level, and the professional level, it's all league play. You get practice, okay, there's a good two to three months of practice on a daily basis, five, six days a week of practice with skim scrimmages and inner squads mixed in, right? And then you have that month before the season, it's all practice all the time, you ramp things up, and then it's game Monday, game Wednesday, game Friday, maybe a doubleheader Tuesday, a doubleheader Friday, you're playing games during the week. And now guys are playing the same amount of games, four to six games in two to three days that high school, college and, and pro baseball players are playing in a week's time. It fucks with pitchers because you can't really develop a starting rotation. Guys are just getting caught up out of nowhere. Pitchers don't know when they're starting. You're playing double, triple headers. Guys aren't getting rest. It's just not normal. It's not natural baseball. So if the, if you're playing more baseball, relatively speaking, than college and professional guys are at 8, 10, 12 years old, burnout is going to happen. Especially when people are pay, paying more, there's going to be more pressure from innately just from the parents and the coaches, right? Parents, you guys are putting more money into your kid than you're normally doing for other sports. You're going to have a higher expectation that they perform well, that they show up to practices, that they do the things that they're supposed to do, right? I get it. Okay. I personally, I don't have kids yet, but I understand where you're coming from. And I get that. At the same time, that pressure is eating at kids. And when they don't perform, when they have a bad game, they are worried about what mom and dad is going to say. They're going to worry about what their coach is going to say. Now with social media, you know, all the kids at their school can see that, oh, Johnny went 0 for 4 with four strikeouts on the day. What a loser. What a terrible game he just had. You know, somebody else can film the, film the game, film his at-bats, and show the worst strikeout he's ever had of his career and get laughed at at school when – I had a very embarrassing moment, like a very one of my most embarrassing moments was in high school. It was in JV baseball. Uh, I believe it was in an inner squad. I don't think it was in a game. It might have been in a game. I was playing first base and a ball got thrown in from the outfield. It was supposed to be a play at the plate going to four and the throw got kicked off, you know, it bounced and, and went over towards the dugout. I picked up the ball. I'm turning. I'm getting ready because I hear the guys yelling four, four, four. I'm committed to throwing home. And then like eat it, eat it, eat it. And I'm like halfway through the throw that I I'm still committed to throw, but I stop it and I just spike the ball directly in front of me. I mean, it was literally like two feet in front of me and the ball rolled into the dugout. I mean, I was like 10 feet from the dugout and I was just like embarrassed. I got a lot of shit from the guys on the team about it, but nobody else outside of the team knew about it. And a week goes by, you know, people forget it, right? That would have been super magnified if that would have been a scenario that happened in today's world on social media. That probably would have went viral, got millions of views, and I'd have been laughed at by a ridiculous amount of people I've never met in this world. And who knows where that could have led me down in a dark path. I know a lot of – I more than I would like to know and count, honestly. Um, I've lost a lot of friends to suicide. One of my best friends from high school that was one of the most amazing talents, uh, amazing people that I had personally known uh, hung himself. And it, it was very heartbreaking. 
and you just don't know what people are going through. And this is one of the things that can, I mean, you don't obviously want that route to happen, but you don't know what people are going through and how personally kids can take this stuff. And in a world where it's, it's so easy to, to do that kind of stuff now and, and see all these kinds of things. Back on track. One of the biggest things that goes around with that unnatural schedule, travel baseball, you play one, uh, you play four to six games on a weekend and you practice one day a week, maybe twice a week. And really most of the time the the second practice of the week is, is parents uh, taking their kid to their hitting coach or pitching coach, and they've got an hour with them. They're not really developing. And most of the time when guys are going to these private lessons, these coaches just want to, overcoach they give the same cookie cutter routines and they want to make it seem like they know their shit so they just talk and talk and talk and they take every kid through the same thing versus letting the kid learn get his reps in get his feel in and work on what it is exactly that he needs to do and then help guide him throughout the rest of the week on the things that he needs to work on let him get those reps in and coach him up throughout the week outside of that but instead they're going out and they're just playing games every single weekend out of the year, right? They're not able to develop their bodies. I mean, this is one of the biggest things that is killing kids and their confidence. You're burning so much energy. They're under sleeping. They're not getting the fuel that they need to recover. They're constantly sore. They're weak and they're playing games on a regular basis. It's not a good combination. And one of the other big things is team hopping. You know, if, if my kid's not getting the playing time, well, I know this other team over here, they're having tryouts or they're looking for a shortstop or they're looking for a pitcher. I'm just going to go over there. And by the time they've gotten to high school, they've played on like a dozen different teams. It's like every spring, every summer and every fall, it's like they're on a new team. It can be ridiculous, right? You guys, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here at this point. You guys have all seen this as parents in the travel baseball world. And it, it, it's overwhelming for kids. I did not have this, right? Playing Little League, playing American Legion. Sure, like you will go through like kind of a draft thing and you might get on a new team every year, but that was like the season. And then I'm playing baseball, I'm, or excuse me, I'm playing basketball. You know, I broke my neck playing football, so I didn't play football, but I was playing other sports. And when I got into high school, the fall was – uh, basketball prep and I, and I would do some extra work on my own for baseball. I would throw, I would hit, et cetera. Uh, then it was basketball season. Then it was baseball season. Then it was summer ball and we're repeating. And that was my four years of high school. Right now, guys who are super serious about getting to that next level, getting to the collegiate level, getting to beyond that, it, it's different. Okay. We can talk about that another time, but most kids aren't living the life of what it takes to really get to the development and get the right amount of coaching that they really need. All right. Showcases is another big thing. And these are not new. All right. They had showcases when I was in school, a lot of the colleges or especially big programs would have them. And it was kind of like an invite only type thing. Like, Oh, you really wanted to go, to the, you know, uh, the Texas showcase or the Oklahoma State, you know, showcase, wherever it is that you're from, you want to go to those big showcases and get seen by those guys and play at that level. I mean, the D1 or bus thing is very prevalent, right? But now it's just turned in to big business, you know, and I, I, I put this comment in on, a, on another Facebook post recently. It was talking, uh, there were, I forgot what it was exactly that they were talking about related to showcases, but I said, be literal with it. Imagine a player was being put on display. Imagine they were a car and they were being put in, into a showcase, right? I was in uh, Atlantic city and I was driving out to Cape Cod uh, a few weeks ago and we passed through Connecticut and we uh, passed through Greenwich. Um, one of the most amazing, beautiful places on, on, 
in the in the states that I've ever been to, one of the richest areas as well. And I passed this luxury garage, this showcase of all these fancy cars. I mean, it had to be worth more than 50 million, probably close to 100 million, if not more, in cars that were in there. But imagine your son shows up to a showcase to be put on display like this, and he's a Honda. He's a Toyota. I have worked the perfect game showcases, the PBR showcases, and other showcases out there. It did not matter what level it was. 80%, if not more, of the players that showed up were not ready to be there. They were getting checked off, marked off. They didn't have the skills. They were weak. They were small. They were slow. They didn't have good arms. They didn't have any plus of the five tools. Now, the five tools are hit for average, hit for power, glove, speed, and arm. And you need to have plus two plus tools at the minimum to really be attending these showcases. And now kids, I, I know so many kids who are going to five, six, multiple showcases per year, year in and year out, thinking that's what it's going to get to get them to that D1 level. And there are guys, I've seen this from the like Indie Ball, the Pecos League, these guys who aren't affiliated, aren't really drafted, but are great players, have one good game where they went yard and just crushed it. They, you know, gassed up and struck out the side, whatever it was, and they got called up based on that one outing. Little things like that happen, and all it takes is to get seen one time by somebody, and, and you can get to that next level, and you don't always need these showcases to do that. So we know the pros of it. I think one of the biggest ones, and I kind of alluded to some of these others, is obviously they're expensive, but the flow of these showcases, I mean, there was one company that I worked for um, running their rap soda. I was running the pitching tech for their showcases, and they had a very good flow to their showcase. There was a schedule, a team would come in, there would be like four teams that would come in and they would cycle through the rotation. And they had the different stations set up. Everybody would rotate. It was on a clock, it was on time. I worked one of the bigger showcases here in, in Texas, one of the bigger names. And the first thing they started off with was 60s. And there was over a hundred guys and they started with the youngest age group and there was just this massive line and it took like two hours to run through sixties for everybody. And then they went to outfield throws and there was this massive line and everybody does their outfield throws and it took forever. It, there was terrible flow guys were getting distracted. You're having to cycle up and down again on getting hot, getting cold, getting hot, getting cold. And this last one here, this is definitely one of the biggest ones. Vi coaches are, tr are overwhelmed with the amount of guys that are there, right? The guys that they see that they want to talk to, they're going to go up and talk to, right? They're going to have a conversation, say, hey, you're invited. Uh, we like this. We like that, et cetera. But most of the guys, especially the ones who aren't that good, are not getting any feedback. They're not getting any coaching. And they don't know what it is that they really need to work on. So they just keep showing up thinking, I'm going to get seen at the next one. Somebody's going to like me and they don't know what they need to work on. And that's, and that's one of the biggest problems. If you're spending that much money on that kind of stuff, you need to know what it is you need to do to get to that next level. So several signs that, that players are burnt out when you're playing year round baseball for multiple years, guys are starting in the spring, you know, especially when you're in these warmer States, you're able to play year round because it, it works that way. When I was in, in Kansas and Oklahoma, even right that you don't, it's a five hour drive from where I live in, in Dallas to in the Dallas Fort Worth area to my home in, in Kansas, really I can get there in like four and a half hours. But from there to Kansas, it's only four and a half hours. So you wouldn't think it's that big of a deal, but ice, snow, winter, you're not playing baseball up, up North like that. And that's not even that North, right? That's not Nebraska. That's not Iowa. That's not South Dakota, North Dakota. 
all these other states out there that have to deal with that. You, you got to do other stuff outside of it, which is great. But a lot of kids, a lot of people move to these other states so they can be in this type of environment thinking that is what's going to get them that exposure, the playing time, the reps, all this stuff. When there are plenty of guys who are getting drafted, getting seen by these coaches from wherever they're from. And there was a great uh, article that I read a few, a few years back talking about how pro scouts are looking for guys from these colder weather states because that means they're going to have less wear and tear on their arm. If they've got a guy, let's say he's from, um, let's just say New York, okay? Same talent, same pitches, same, like, let's talk pitchers, right? Because pitchers wear down more than position players. If you got a pitcher from New York and you got a pitcher from Texas, they've, they're both the same age. They're both throw the same. They both got the same build, similar um, pitches, velocity, uh, ability with those pitches, right? Stuff, all that kind of stuff is very similar. They're probably going to draft the guy from New York versus the guy from Texas because the guy from Texas has been playing a lot more baseball. There's a lot less wear and tear on that arm in New York, most likely, if that's where he's been from and that's where he's been playing. Now, guys can still get on these travel ball teams, uh, like we were talking about earlier, these showcase teams or these travel teams and go play year round wherever they're from. Like they fly in guys all the time for these really big organizations to go play for them for a weekend and bring arms in, especially. So it's not like they can't do that. Right. But these are all the signs of burnout. And let me rephrase, not literally all the signs, but these are signs of burnout and start asking yourself if you're a parent, if you're a coach, you know, what players do I recognize is my son like this? Do I recognize his ways of, of thinking like this? Do I hear him talking like this to himself? Is he showing up with the same energy that he used to have when he was younger? You know, does he, does he want to watch baseball on TV anymore? Does he still want to go to the Rangers games, to the Sox games, wherever you're from? Does he want to go watch the, the D1 teams? Even I used to like, I'd love going to watch uh, Cali County, the junior college where I'm from. Now they are a great program. And last year, if they didn't win it. They got second place in the Juco World Series. It's a, a small town in, in Kansas. Um, I loved watching those guys play. Do you go watch the junior college games where you're at? Maybe they're not that good. So it's not that exciting. I get it, right? You don't want to go watch a team that's absolutely terrible. Go play, right? These guys were good. I liked watching them play, but we would go up to Wichita and watch Wichita State play. This was back in, in the 90s and 2000s, really like the early 2000s when they were really good. And it was fun, super excited. I love going to the Wichita State camps, right? Do they have the drive and motivation? Are they asking to go to this stuff? Or are you as the parent pushing these type of activities on them? All right, so let's talk about four ways to really reignite their passion for the game. I don't just want to talk theory. I don't just want to talk about ideas or problems. Let's talk solutions. Let's talk about redefining success. Okay. Now this is a big one. Okay. Most guys, most kids get caught up in outs. Oh, did I get a hit? Right. Their batting average. Um, I, I Pitchers, they get caught up in ERA and wins, all these things. They're looking at the wrong things because this is a team sport right? You could absolutely smoke a baseball and line out to the shortstop, the center fielder. You could have had a bomb, but you got robbed by the outfielder, right? You could have absolutely crushed a baseball, but it was foul. As a pitcher, you could have pitched an amazing game, could have been striking out one or two guys an inning, but your defense kept making errors, you let that get to you and you walk guys, those errors cost and you gave up runs. They, they gave up little bloop hits. They were weak contact, but they just got out. They just got over the outstretched arm of your second baseman in between right and center. All these little things are out of your control, but here are some things that guys can control. You can really start tracking these 
have a journal, which is number two, track your quality at bats, track the amount of hard hit balls, every at bat, how many hard hit balls did you have in that at bat or how many at bats were you having hard hit balls? How many of the pitches you saw five pitches in that at bat? How many of those did you read well out of the pitcher's hands? How well were you on time for those pitches? How many at-bats did you have that you were confident in the box, that you had a game plan and you executed on that game plan, regardless of the outcome? Same thing with pitchers. How many first pitch strikes did you throw? Did you have a quality start? Did you have a quality inning? What percentage of strikes are you throwing? The strike-to-walk ratio is a big one that college coaches and scouts are looking for because we guys need strike throwers. You know, how many pitches in your – and this is, this is game stuff. You can easily translate this over to practice as well. How many number of pitches in that 30, 40, 50 pitch bullpen did you feel good with, right? They came out of the hand, your timing, your mechanics felt good. The feel felt good. There's the real versus feel kind of thing. How well did you feel about that? Were you able to execute on your game plan? Journaling, basketball and football, football especially, right? Every Monday after the game on Friday or Saturday or in the NFL on, on uh, Sundays, Monday is film day. They're watching game film. Baseball, how often are you really watching game film? I mean, I remember I don't have, honestly, any game film from me in, in high school. Granted, you kind of had to be a little bit more affluent to go out and buy a nice video camera to – video record things right nowadays everybody's got a smartphone super easy to just pop it out different world back then but take time to video your games your practices even your workouts and be your own coach because when you're in the game parents this is something you're probably all guilty of you're trying to coach from the stands you can't help the kids they have to help themselves and they're going to be the ones coaching themselves. You got to let them fail. You got to let them learn. And they need to be able to do that on the fly. And one of the best ways to do that is they need, most kids now, even with smartphones, don't know what their swing looks like. They don't know what their pitching mechanics look like, right? They don't know what their running mechanics look like, how they run. It's super easy to do that these days. Take the time to watch film of yourself and what do you see as a player? Now, number two is a, is a, is a game changer right here. Simply journaling practices when you, when you get, you can even pair this up with the video footage that you're doing um, at, at practice or, or during the games. But you can have a literal journal. Like if you watch, if you really watch pro games, the best of the best, they'll you'll see them, they'll pan over to the dugout and these guys are journaling in there. Or obviously today's world is a lot more advanced. They got the iPads in there. So after they get done with an at bat that they didn't like, they've got the iPad pulled up and they're watching their film from that last at bat, right? Or they're watching film of the relief pitcher that's about to come in. But I remember uh watching on tv and seeing guys that were journaling they had a journal and they were writing things down and one of the biggest things is i i, I saw this video from from pete rose now granted this is a, not a higher level concept but i'll i'll just i'll tell you what he said and then you'll see why it's not really as relevant for the younger kids because they still got a lot of mechanical stuff to work on. But basically he's like, when you're in a slump, there's only six or eight things that you're going to change. You're going to move up in the box. You're going to move back in the box. You're going to move closer to the plate. You're going to move away from the plate. You're going to choke up on the bat. You're going to choke down on the bat. You're not going to change your swing because your swing is what got you to the bigs. Now, a lot of kids, they probably still need work on their swing. They probably still need work on their pitching, but if you're good, it's usually a peer that needs to be changed. And, and what I'm talking about is when they're in a slump, 
they're thinking negatively. They're not thinking about all the things that they were. Every player has been on a hot streak. Every player has been in a slump. And if you haven't, you will. It's going to happen. But there's specific thought threads. The way if you were to transcribe this video, there would be a text of exactly what I'm saying. You could almost transcribe your own thoughts and have them down in a journal of what it is exactly you were thinking after you had a great round of BP. You could transcribe your own thoughts after you've been on an 0 for 12 slump. What were you thinking about? Probably thinking about not striking out. Probably thinking about not chasing uh, pitches out of the zone, not swinging at balls. You know, oh, I hope I don't walk this guy, right? These are not the things you need to be focused on as a hitter, as a baseball player. And guys don't know that they're not thinking about success. They're not thinking and acting and handling themselves the way they were when they were playing well. And when you can have that discrepancy and really notice that by looking back at your journals and it starts with practice, what did, what did a great round of BP go like today? What was, what was I thinking about? What was I feeling? What was I focused on? What was I doing that made this work? And the same thing, you knew this same thing when you have a bad round too, okay? You can do it with an audio message. You can pull up voice memos on your phone and do it that way. Or you can uh, do a quick journal, write it down, quick notes, quick thoughts. Or one of the things I like, you know, is a quick video of it. And that's going to really give your emotions, your facial expressions, your body language, as well as your tonality, right? And the last thing, I hope you're seeing this. I'm going to move this just in case. Start celebrating and rewarding the smaller wins uh, versus just all the big wins, right? Winning a baseball game, going four for four, uh, hitting a home run, uh, winning the tournament, getting second place, all these big things that everybody is like rewarding them for. You know, baseball is a game of failure. And more often than not, we are going to be failing as baseball players. So we need to find wins along the way. So setting up these milestones, and that goes back to focus on the controllables up here. When you start tracking these things in practice, when you start doing these things in games, you can start to see a trend of success and you can be positive. You can encourage yourself. You can celebrate those wins that, hey, I may have went uh, two for 15 at the plate um, batting average wise, but I hit 10 of those 15 balls are really hard. That is a sign that you're going to break out of this slump very soon, that those are going to start to fall, that you're having a good approach at the plate, right? Guys who's focused on two for 12 or two for 15 versus a guy who's focused on, I hit 10 balls really hard, or I was, you know, I felt like I had 10 quality at bats on my last 15, right? That's a game changer, okay? All right, so building the body, okay? I talked about this earlier with the showcase side of things. Most kids aren't really focused on the physical until they get later into high school. I mean, I remember my dad telling me, you know, just do some push-ups. You, you don't need to get big and bulky. You know, that's for football players and, and this and that. Go look at – have you not seen today's baseball players, folks? These college guys, these big – Division one guys, go look at the guys who were getting drafted. Go look at the professional guys. These guys are monster athletes. I'm not talking about Daniel Vogelbach. I'm not talking about Prince Fielder or Pablo Sandoval. These outliers, we can all find these outliers, but they're, I'm not talking about the guys who were six, eight, the, these Aaron judges of the world. Jose Altuve built, even though he's like five, four. Look at, um, uh, Corey Seager, you look at any top talent across the board, even these guys who aren't like the best of the best, they are still strong. They are still athletic. And that is one of the reasons why they're able to do what they do because baseball is one of the most athletic sports and physically demanding sports that is out there. 162 games in 180 days is really what the major league baseball season is like. That is a lot of games. And if your body is not prepared for that, you're not going to be able to play that long. Talked about this earlier. Kids are playing longer 
seasons now at younger ages, relatively speaking, than pro guys are. They're taking less time off. They're playing more games. Yet they are not doing anything to prepare their bodies. Now, this subject here is a whole deep dive of its own <clears throat> because I believe every player needs their own personalized program that they are able to adjust and adapt to. There's um, different movements that need to be learned and understood, right? But number two, train like an athlete, not a bodybuilder. So these are the main movements that we have and that need to be trained. And going to the gym, when most people think of this, and this is what I did when I was younger, this is what the vast majority of kids do. Fitness, strong looking people are the bodybuilder types out there. They're doing all the muscle pumps, the biceps, the abs, the pecs, the mirror muscles. Mirror muscles are not performance muscles, okay? We need to be able to train like an athlete. And athletes do total body movements. They don't sit and get strong on a machine. They are producing force. They are powerful. They are mobile. They are agile. And these are the types of things that they're doing. So here is kind of a progression. I get guys a little bit of muscle hypertrophy, get a little bit of a base built up. Then we go to muscular strength and building strength. Then it's power and it's speed. Everybody is different in where they're starting out at. Some guys already have a good strength base built, but they're not powerful, quick, fast twitch, explosive. Some guys may be quicker and fast twitch, but they're really not strong enough to produce enough force to be able to throw the baseball hard enough, to hit the baseball hard enough, right? Everybody's a little bit different. That's why I, I believe a lot more people need individualized programs. And third thing with building the body, food is fuel. Guys got to eat for performance. And this is one of the controllables. This is one of the simplest things that guys can control, but they eat like shit. They go to the ballpark and they get a hot dog or some chips and, and popcorn and this and that, have a soda, you know, in between games, have a Gatorade loaded with sugar, bunch of shit. And they don't know any better because monkey see, monkey do. Their teammates are doing it. Mom and dad, you guys are got to hold yourselves accountable here, right? You guys are buying them the junk food. You're supporting these bad habits when going back to the co the players need to be their own coach. Players have this control. They control what goes into their body. Now, as parents, I get it, especially when they're uh, middle school and high school, they're younger. You're going to be buying their groceries most of the time, right? So this is another subject, again, we can dive deeper into. I've also done another training on this um, and something I walk through every single player that I work with on these subjects, but this is something that needs to be taken more seriously, especially a lot of baseball players. And I was like this, you know, our, our scrawny kids, our smaller kids, they need to put on muscle mass and size, and you're not going to do that by working out if you're not eating enough. And your body is a machine. It is your livelihood as an athlete. The saying, imagine if you had one car to drive your entire life, how well would you treat that car? Well, you need to tr treat your car and prepare it like it's a Rolls Royce. Because if you want to be a peak athlete, have peak performance and play at the highest levels, your body needs to be in peak shape. Your body needs to be well taken care of. And food is very critical for that. All right. And last thing, uh, actually two more things, gamifying practice. Okay. Little things just to make practice more fun for guys. You got to get the skill work in. You got to have the, the reps and the focus practice, but Games like infield knockout where, you know, like in basketball, you've got a line of people and it's playing knockout. First guy shoots, he misses. The guy behind him makes it. That first guy's knocked out, right? You can do um, knockout similar to that in ground balls. Like, okay, we're going to keep hitting ground balls to you, uh, making this for, uh, backhand play. If you, you know, bobble it, you're out kind of thing, right? Uh, in high school, a fun one we did, and we, we didn't really do this until the summer uh, in American Legion ball. We saw it our head coach from the high school, but – one of the last rounds we would do in BP would be home run round, right? It's like, how many home runs can you hit off these six or eight pitches in a round, 
right? Or some, well, the other fun one we like doing is base hit round. You stay in there and however many base hits in a row you can get is the number. Whoever gets the most wins, everybody else has to run or do some shit like that, right? Uh, 21 for pitchers, you know, this is one where, uh, you know, maybe you've played this one uh, with your kids or, or they, they're playing it with their buddies. It's one point for a chest shot, two points for a head shot. First one of 21 wins, right? Try, you're having some fun. You're trying to put a little something on and maybe you mix in, oh, if you throw a change up to the spot, it's double points or a breaking ball, it's double points or what have you. So those are fun ways that kids can get more involved while still getting better. To just take time to play different leagues, playing blitz ball, softball, wiffle ball, even kickball. It's still baseball related. It feels like baseball. They're going to be confident at it because they're playing baseball. Like when we play, uh, it, it's crazy to me that, you know, all, in Texas, all these high school kids have baseball class. They get to go to class. They get to go to baseball practice as a class. It's like their first or their last period of the day. I'm like, what? That is awesome, right? We didn't have that. We had baseball after school, and then we'd have PE class. And when softball came around for the week, right, we, we like every other, every week would be, or every few days would be a new game that we got to play in class. When it was uh, dodgeball, when it was softball, the baseball players got pumped because they knew they were just going to go crush it, Right going out and playing in, in some of these leagues for fun, taking some time off, which is the next one and playing in these kind of leagues. It's a lot different. These kids are going to have a blast and it's going to make them want to keep playing the game. Uh, the Sandlot style, right? Everybody, everybody's seen the Sandlot movie. If you're in baseball playing pickup basketball is a regular thing, guys. We go out to uh, an outside court you know, there's a bunch of guys around. We play three on three, five on five, whatever. Just pick up with different guys who are around. Some are old, some are young, whatever. Pick up baseball. It's not really a thing anymore. But getting out and, and playing street ball, getting and and playing with uh, like not like actual baseball and bat, but we would use like um, like a tennis ball or uh, these like stick bats kind of thing. And the other one, if you haven't seen this, go look it up. It is super cool. One, they call them batillas uh, in, in like the Dominican and stuff. And my accent with that, the pronunciation of that is probably laughable. But cap, look at the Japan cap baseball. These videos of these guys are playing baseball and they're throw, throwing caps. And these, <laughs> it is so cool to watch. Like not only is it fun for kids to go out and do that, but the hand-eye coordination and the skill development that they have when they're doing this is, is next level. All right, and last thing is, is taking time off, playing other sports. We already talked about there are so many talented athletes out there playing other sports. You're not like FOMO, fear of missing out. You're not going to get worse if you take some time off from baseball. It can help you. You're not going to get beat out by the other guy just because you went to play another season or you took a couple months off to rest or get your body right while another kid played fall ball and you did it, right? It's not like that. Now, maybe when you're a junior or a senior or you're in college, yeah, it's a little bit different to, to play year round, if you will. But even then, these guys are taking time off. Okay. Be a student of the game. We talked about this earlier, going and watching pro games, college games, watching them on TV. You know, even I, I've watched, granted, you know, I have more of a coach mindset than, than players do, but go, sitting down and watching the Little League World Series, and there are so many talented kids in there. And I'm looking at, oh, this guy, man, he's got a sweet looking swing. Or one of the other plays um, was it, I think it was the international game, Japan versus Nicaragua, when Nicaragua won in extras. The guy grounded out to third. The third baseman tries to step over to third to get a double play. One, he misses the bag, so he doesn't even get the out at three, then tries to throw home to get the force out or get the out to get the tag because it's not a force out anymore. He makes a bad throw, and they walk it off. But if he just would have caught the ball, thrown out to home to get that out at uh, the lead out, the force out, make a good throw, might have had a chance to get the guy at first, but you've gotten an out for sure. Now you're down to two outs, and you can play back normal depth. You don't have to play in instead of rushing – and, and doing that, it's like little things like that. Like, okay, you're getting more reps in as a player because you're seeing these situations of other guys and knowing 
yeah, they fail at this level. They make mistakes too. I can learn from that mistake. And when that play happens to me, I'm prepared for it. And that's what a lot of the confidence side of thing comes down to is when you know better, you do better. And when you've seen it done before, you are able to adjust and adapt. And, you know, number three is just taking that time off. So really hope you guys got a lot of value out of this video. If you've got questions, please comment them below. Any feedback or thoughts on this stuff, you saw something in there that you want to know more about, um, you've got questions on, or something that really resonated with you that you're seeing with your kid out there, you know, I'd love to hear some feedback from you guys on this. Um, I'm going to be doing two live trainings like this every week. Uh, not every week, every month inside of the group. So leave some feedback. Let me know what subjects, topics you want to hear. I've definitely got things that I, I think uh, more parents and coaches need to know because most of this group is parents and coaches. So um, I'm going to be sharing that type of, of knowledge and insight out there, but would love to hear what it is you guys would like to learn. So that's all I got for you guys tonight. Um, stay tuned for the next one. God bless.